Welcome to World Med School. Um, my name is David Hamer. I'm a professor in the Department of Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. I also am the director of the Travel Clinic at Boston Medical Center. Um, and this is part of the microbiology section of World Medical School. So this is an outline of my talk. I'm gonna be describing the epidemiology of uh, chikungunya including factors responsible for emergence and spread of this viral infection. Uh, describe the clinical manifestations, and then I'm gonna finish with a, a brief synopsis of the approach to diagnosis of this disease. So this is a figure, uh, really a table, showing a different species of uh, sort of arthropod-borne viruses that may affect humans. Uh, there's a wide uh, range of them. Um, some of the important ones are in the flavivirus family, but also there are many in the, in the uh, Togeviridae family and in, in, in the category of alpha virus. And um, these are, tend to be arthritogenic. They're more likely to cause arthritis manifestations. And one of the major ones in this category is chikungunya virus. So chikungunya, as I've just mentioned, is an alpha virus, um, is in the alpha virus genus. Remember the Togeviridae family, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. This was first identified in the 1950s in Africa, um, in the southern province of Tanganyika, what is now Tanzania. And there was a big outbreak, and one of the local chiefs um, ended up uh, naming this um, uh, after a local term, kunganyala, which means to dry up or become contorted. This is because of the intense uh, joint pains that may arise with this infection. And this gradually evolved into chikungunya. There are two major vectors for chikungunya. The, the, the most common one worldwide is Aedes aegypti. Um, this tends to be a relatively promiscuous mosquito taking multiple blood meals and prefers to feed on humans. Also tends to be found uh, more commonly in, in urban areas. Aedes albopictus actually today has a much wider global geographic distribution, um, but it, it may feed on, on humans or other mammals if, if other mammals are nearby. It may be found in uh, semi-urban areas, even rural areas. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it, it is much more widespread and, so, and it is capable of transmitting chikungunya. So chikungunya, chikungunya virus is maintained in a sylvatic cycle that basically it cycles between um, mosquitoes, forest dwelling mosquitoes, and then non-human primates. Um, but it may shift into a, uh, an urban cycle. Um, and this urban cycle can lead to um, explosive epidemics as, as I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, and, and there are, um, you know, there are other uh, alpha viruses that may cause human disease, including uh, uh, Murray Valley um, and, and others. But, but for now, um, or sorry, sorry, not Murray Valley, Ross River, um, uh, as well as myerovirus. And myerovirus is one that we're concerned may cause epidemics in the future in Latin America and the Caribbean. So this is primarily spread by the bite of infected Aedes species mosquitoes. Again, mostly Aedes aegypti, but Aedes albopictus is, is a competent vector as well. Um, there's been documented uh, bloodborne uh, in infections, so either through uh, transfusion of contaminated blood products or needle sticks, although these are relatively uncommon. And one of the larger outbreaks in the Indian Ocean um, in uh, Réunion, on the island of Réunion in, I think, 2005, 2006, uh, they, the local health authorities documented mother-to-child transmission. And now it's been clearly shown that this can occur, tends to occur more commonly if a mother is infected close to the time of delivery. And uh, a relatively small proportion of exposed infants um, or neonates become infected. Um, and, and not all of them are symptomatic. In, in non-epidemic periods, there are a number of reservoirs, including uh, monkeys, uh, rats, and birds that may harbor the virus. So this is a, a complicated figure, but this just shows you know, the origin spread of chikungunya virus and its vectors. And there are several different clades of the virus, which I won't go into in detail. 
um, but but suffice it to say that 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 some of these are, are have caused substantial outbreaks. So this was first described in the 50s. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, then found in, in West Africa in, in the 60s and 70s, and then sporadically um, uh, since then in, other, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. As I mentioned, there was a large outbreak in the Indian Ocean to the east of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in uh, Réunion, uh, Mauritius, uh, the Seychelles, and other islands in this area. And this caused a fairly substantial outbreak since that, that was, again, in 2005, 2006. Since then, there have been more recent outbreaks um, in that area as well. The biggest outbreak um, was when this virus uh, spread to the Western Hemisphere. It probably um, arose somewhere in the Caribbean, um, possibly in St. Martin, um, and then it spread very rapidly throughout the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, and led to a very large burden of cases. So some of the factors that have been uh, identified that are responsible for the emergence of chikungunya include uh, virus adaptation. This is an interesting story that relates to the 2005-2006 Réunion outbreak. There, a mutation in residue 226 of the membrane fusion glycoprotein um, was uh, uh, led to a change in the virus that allowed it to be better adapted to transmission by Aedes albopictus. So that large outbreak um, was primarily transmitted by Aedes albopictus, whereas the, the even larger one that followed in the Western Hemisphere was predominantly Aedes aegypti. Uh, there are a number of ecological factors related to changes in weather patterns, but also uh, rising global temperatures um, that may lead to more standing water um, and, and a higher risk of transmission. And then warmer summers in, in uh, Western Europe um, have led to an increased risk of introduction and spread of chikungunya in countries such as Italy and France. Uh, physical environment's important and anywhere, this is a little bit like the transmission of dengue, anywhere where there's standing water, just a small amount of standing water can serve as a breeding site. This can be household water stores, manholes, used tires, and, and uh, this can lead to the, uh, basically allows for the breeding of Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. Um, travel is important for spread of the, of the virus. So it, it's very easy for a person to become infected in a country um, and then fly home. And if the right vectors are there, have onward transmission um, and, and local transmission for a period of time of this disease. Um, population migrations in the Indian Ocean region probably were responsible for some of the earlier outbreaks. The other challenge is that a lot of countries do not have good surveillance systems or any surveillance systems in place, and therefore there may be a delay in identifying the initial outbreak. Uh, this is a, an estimate of the spread, including the, the major lineages of chikungunya um, by 2050. And, this is a combination of, of changing epidemiology doing, due to you know, global warming, but also aberrant weather patterns um, and, and progressive, uh, more widespread distribution of competent vectors, in particular, Aedes uh, albopictus in Western Europe and the United States. So clinically, this incubation period tends to be really short, typical for viral uh, arboviral infections. Um, you know, a few days on average, um, maybe as, as long as nearly two weeks. And this is followed often by the abrupt onset of, of symptoms, including a high fever, headache, back pain, uh, muscle aches, and joint pains. The, the uh, arthralgias can be quite intense. They may affect a number of different joints, both large joints and small joints, um, of, in particular of the, the, the feet, uh, knees, um, and then hands and wrists. Uh, there may be a rash present, but this is only present in about half of cases. Um, the main challenge with this disease is the severe joint pain. And this may be both 
arthralgias, but it may also lead to um, arthritis with overt in, in, inflamed joints. And, and some patients will develop um, a polyarthritis that, that continues for months or even years afterwards. And sometimes this is, is so damaging that it's, it's very similar to the acute inflammatory arthritis one may have with rheumatoid arthritis. And in the end, it ends up being managed in a similar way. The uh, risk factors have been sh for persistence of the arthritis include uh, age over 40, uh, female uh, sex, um, a variety of comorbid conditions, including diabetes mellitus, um, having a very uh, painful initial episode. And, and there's some others that have been elucidated as well um, that I'll describe in a second. Um, this may lead to decreased ability to perform daily activities, including either working or going to school, but also can, can interfere with just simple things like walking. Um, and then in a study that we conducted in, in a group of travelers, we showed um, that there's a substantial cost of infection um, to travelers, both the acute infection but also the, the chronic infection that follows. This is a summary of several studies uh, looking at the, the duration of uh, persistent arthralgia and you can see that the various studies have shown um, sort of different lengths of, of persistence of symptoms. So again, some of the risk factors I mentioned, older age, not that old, honestly, you know, 35 to 45 and, and older, um, uh, more severe symptoms in the acute phase, female sex, low educational level, um, being infected in the Indian Ocean, prior history of a musculoskeletal disorder um, have all been shown to be associated with this, um, with the persistence of, of arthralgias or arthritis. And interestingly, at least one study suggested uh, a vegetarian diet, diet was associated with severe disability. So complications are rare, but some of the major complications are listed here, myocarditis and pericarditis. Uh, this, is, this is quite rare. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint the incidence, but it's definitely less than 0.2% or thereabouts, but it can be fatal and can be severe. Uh, meningoencephalitis is also another rare complication, as is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, there are other less common uh, complications as well. I've already mentioned the potential for mother-to-child transmission in uh, the context of pregnancy. So uh, mortality um, is very low, 0.1% um, to 0.8%. Usually, uh, you know, it's more in the 0.1 to 0.3% range for the case fatality rate. On the other hand, hospitalization is not uncommon because of the severity of the uh, joint symptoms that may arise. And, and this is in particular um, with underlying comorbidities, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, the, the potential for both death and hospitalization increases. So diagnosis is, is fairly straightforward. Um, ideally, um, a, a reverse transcriptase PCR can be done. This has to be done early in the first five to seven days of the infection when individuals are viremic. As of now, there is no antigen test available for diagnosis. And then after that, it's serology. IgM tends to rise around day four or five to day seven. And the IgG will follow in around day seven to day 10. Virus can be isolated, but this is really much more of a research tool. And one of the challenges with this disease is there's a substantial overlap in the manifestations of chikungunya. I mean, chikungunya tends to have a little more fever than Zika, but, but similar to dengue, uh, rash is a little less common than, than in Zika, maybe a little more common than dengue. Uh, certainly the joint pains and f overt arthritis are definitely more common. Conjunctivitis is rare, and then bleeding complications are rare. But basically, clinically, it's not possible to distinguish these three, so it's important to consider um, uh, the, uh, all three diagnoses if all three viruses are circulating in, a, in an area. So in conclusion, uh, chikungunya has been responsible for large outbreaks uh, worldwide. It continues to cause sporadic outbreaks. Uh, one of the more recent ones was in uh, Paraguay uh, a year ago, and then in uh, Minas Gerais in Brazil um, it, with a concurrent dengue outbreak. Mortality is very low, but there is substantial morbidity associated with prolonged arthritis. There's a lot of clinical overlap with dengue and Zika, so all three diseases must be considered. 
And the worrisome uh, issue is that there's great potential for spread of chikungunya um, into parts of Western Europe and the United States in the future due to climate change. So thank you very much for your attention and for studying with World Medical School.